Hello and welcome. In this course, you will learn how to use the Python package pandas to discover interesting insights about data. My name is Douglas Starnes, and I'll be your host as you slice and dice data to query, clean, and more. Before getting started, there are a few prerequisites that you should have installed. First is Python 3. The current version of Python as of recording is Python 3.9, but earlier versions will work just fine. I wouldn't go back any further than 3.5 or 3.6, but 3.7 and up will be okay. I strongly recommend that if you don't have Python on your machine to get it with the Anaconda distribution. This is a one-stop shop for all of your data science and Python needs. You can download the free open source version of Anaconda from www.anaconda.com slash products slash individual. Click the download button and select an installer for your operating system. After the installation is complete, you will be able to open a terminal or command prompt and everything will be ready to go. Anaconda will pre-configure an environment which includes pandas. But Anaconda also does more. In the data science community is a tool called Jupyter Notebook. This is an interactive computing tool that basically stores the output of a Python session in a web page. I'll be using it for the demo in this course, and I strongly suggest you do too, as Jupyter Notebook is a good habit to develop if you want to work in data science. To start a Jupyter Notebook server, simply run the command Jupyter Notebook at the prompt. The default web browser on the system will open to this page. If it doesn't, Simply copy and paste this URL from the output of the Jupyter Notebook server. Be sure to copy the entire token as this is required for security purposes in case the server were exposed on the public web. Click the New button and then select Python 3 under Notebook. This will create a new Jupyter Notebook that understands Python 3. In the first cell, enter the following Python code to import the pandas package. Press Shift Enter to execute the cell. Now, this cell won't have any output, but if you execute this Python code in the next cell, you'll see the version of the pandas package that was installed. Of course, you don't have to use Anaconda. You could create a virtual environment using the python.org installation and then install pandas and Jupyter Notebook using pip. Basically, to follow along in this course, you'll need just Python and pandas. Jupyter Notebook and Anaconda just make it easier. You could also run the demo on Google Colab, a free service for hosting Jupyter Notebooks from Google. I'll include a link to a Jupyter Notebook on Google Colab that will have all of the demo code ready to run. In the next lesson, you'll see how to take advantage of Pandas and Jupyter Notebook to load and explore a dataset. Let's load up a dataset. Here is the URL for a CSV or comma-separated file containing basketball data from the website 538. You can use another package, Requests, to download that file. Requests is a package that wraps the URL lib API provided by the Python standard library. It makes networking tasks with HTTP much easier. In fact, the author calls it HTTP for humans. If you've installed Anaconda, Requests is included in the default environment, and if not, you can install it with pip. First, import requests. Then call the get function and pass it the download URL. Store the response. Check the status code of the response. If it is 200, then everything should be good to go. Open a file and write the content of the response to it. Now the contents of the file are stored locally. Excellent. It's time to load the CSV file into pandas. Go ahead and import pandas. Notice that the pandas package is aliased as pd. This is not a requirement, but it is often how pandas is imported. You'll be making significant use of the pandas package, and while shortening the package name by four letters might not seem like a lot right now, over time, it will reduce the amount that you need to type. The dataset can be loaded from the CSV file. 
use the function csv and pass it the path of the csv file. And look at the type of NBA. So what is this data frame? You'll learn more about it later in the course, but for now, think of a data frame as a way to store tabular data. That is, rows and columns. In fact, you can see how many rows are in the data frame by getting its length. And you can see there are 126,314 rows. The rows and columns can be found in the shape of NBA. The shape attribute is a tuple. The first value is the number of rows, and the second value is the number of columns. This means there are 23 columns in the dataset. To see the first five rows, get the head of NBA. If you wanted to see 10 rows, you could pass 10 to head. The default number is 5. And you can see one of the benefits of using Jupyter Notebook with Pandas. The notebook is displayed in a web page, and it takes advantage of rich formatting using HTML, CSS, and in some cases, interactivity with JavaScript. The column names are bold, and the rows are zebra striped so they are easier to distinguish. But where did the column names come from? Go back to the tab with the directory listing. You should see the CSV file. Click on it to open it. Notice that the first row of the file contains the column names, also referred to as the header row. By default, the readCSV function will assume the first row of the CSV file to be the column names. Something else interesting about this data frame is that not all of the columns are displayed. The columns in the middle have been omitted, and an ellipse is used as a placeholder to save space. You can force pandas to show all of the columns by setting the maximum number of columns. Also, notice that some of the numeric columns are showing up with six decimal places. Fix the number of decimal places to two with this option. Now get the last five rows of the data frame with the tail function. You can see Pandas has applied the formatting. Also, you can get a specific number of rows using tail, the same as with head. To get the last 10 rows, pass the value 10 to the function tail. In the next lesson, you'll start to explore your data using the statistics methods supplied by the data frame. Start off by calling the info method on the NBA data frame. This reveals some interesting data about the dataset. First, it lists all 23 columns. For each one, it provides the number of non-null values and the data type. So game order is an integer and game ID is an object. More on that in a second. At the bottom, you can see that of the 23 columns, six are floats, seven are integers, and 10 are objects. Also, none of the columns have null values except for notes. So what is this object? Notice that some of the values in the data frame are strings. In pandas, the raw values in a data frame are stored using NumPy data types. There is no string data type in NumPy, so it uses the generic object. Going further, pandas can compute statistics about the data frame with the describe method. Here, you can see that the average number of points scored in a game for this data set is 102, and that the highest scoring game had 186 points. But for some of the columns, it doesn't make sense to take these stats. For example, the average year is not going to be useful, although you can see that the year range is from 1947 to 2015. And notice that the stats are computed only for the numeric columns. The objects were omitted. Pandas is a great tool for exploratory data analysis. This means looking around the data set and navigating it to answer questions. Take a look at the number of games played by each team. The value counts method will count the number of times each value occurs in a particular column, team ID in this example. So the team BOS played the most games with 5,997, and the team SDS played the fewest with 11. Do the same with the Franchise ID column. 
The franchise Lakers played 6,024 games, and the franchise Huskies played 60. Now, when the team franchise Lakers is mentioned, most people will think of the Los Angeles Lakers. In this data set, the team ID for the Los Angeles Lakers is LAL, and the team LAL only has 5,078 games. So who are the other 1,000 games played by? This can be done in several steps that can be expressed with a single line of code. First, you want to find all of the rows where the franchise ID is Lakers. This will simply return a series of bools. You'll learn more about series later in the course, but for now, think of it as a list with an index. The values indicate if that row had a value of Lakers in the franchise ID column. You can now use those bools to filter the data frame with the LOC attribute. You'll also learn more about LOC later in the course. But notice the number of rows returned. There are 6,024 rows returned and 6,024 values with Lakers in the franchise ID column. Now, you don't want all of the columns, just the team ID. And while you can already see that there is more than one team associated with the Lakers franchise, use the value counts method to count them. Again, the LAL team, the Los Angeles Lakers, played 5,078 games. But there was also a team called the Minnesota Lakers that played 946 games for a total of 6,024 games played by the Lakers franchise. It's unlikely you have heard of the Minnesota Lakers, and here is why. Get all of the rows that have a team ID of MNL, that's the ID for the Minnesota Lakers, and then get only the date game column, which is the date that the game was played. As you can see, it's been a while since the Minnesota Lakers have played basketball. But just how long? Intuitively, you would just get the most recent date or maximum value, and that's stored in the date game column. The problem is that the dates are stored as strings or objects in the data frame. This causes some issues. First, here is the code to get the maximum value from the date game column with a team ID of MNL. This code works, and it works correctly. It returns the maximum value in the column, and the maximum value in the column is the string 4 slash 9 slash 1959. However, strings and dates are interpreted differently by Python, and Pandas does not implicitly cast a string in date format to a date. However, it provides a helper function to do just that. The pd.toDateTime function will convert a column of strings into dates, assuming the strings are valid date formats. So that you can compare the strings and dates, store the dates in a new column. Creating a new column on a data frame is as simple as assigning to the column name. Now, if you run the same code again, but on the date played column, it returns a date of March 26, 1960. However, since the string representation of March 26, 1960, which would be 3 slash 26 slash 1960, precedes the string 4 slash 9 slash 1959, the latter is incorrectly returned as the latest date in the date game column. Also, notice that if you call nba.info again, the date played column uses the NumPy datetime64 data type. Let's try one more exercise. You can easily find the total number of points scored by the Boston Celtics by getting only rows where the team ID is BOS and the sum of the PTS column. The total number of points scored is 626,484 across the team history. But what was the average number of points per year? First, get the dates of the games played by the Boston Celtics, and you already know how to do this. You're only interested in the years, so you can apply a lambda function to each date. The apply function will pass each value to the lambda, and then all you need to do is extract the year attribute. To remove the duplicates, call the unique method. Take the length, and you're almost finished. 
to get the total number of points again and store it, you can just modify the cell that calls the sum method. And now you can calculate the average points per year. And it comes up to about 9,000 points each year. Now you just saw another powerful feature of the Jupyter Notebook. You are able to modify a cell without retyping it. This lets you experiment and iterate rapidly, and that is a big part of exploratory data analysis. So keep your eyes open for ways to use this and save yourself some trouble. In the next lesson, you'll dive under the hood and see how Panda's data frames are assembled. Until now, you've been looking at data frames in terms of rows and columns. And while it makes sense to think of them intuitively using rows and columns, the internal structure is a little different. What you've been thinking of as a column so far is in reality another Pandas data structure called a series. You briefly saw a series in the previous lesson, but it's time to take a closer look. The series consists of two parts, values and identifiers. The values are a sequence, similar to a list in Python. The identifiers are mapped to the values. The collection of identifiers is called the index. It's quite simple to create a series in Pandas. The values and index can be accessed with the values and index attributes. The values are returned as a NumPy array. The index is a special type of range index with an upper and lower bound. And there are other types of indexes that you'll see later on. You can also explicitly declare the index with the index keyword argument. This time the index is just an index type. Keep in mind that the range index is still valid as well. Every series will keep a numeric index by default. You may have noticed some similarities with the series you have created and the primitive Python collection types. For example, the revenues series is similar to a Python list. The city revenues series is like a Python dictionary as you can use the index to retrieve the associated values. The dictionary can also be used as the data for a series. And the series also supports the keys method and the in keyword. Notice that the series can be used to create a data frame. The keys of the dictionary are used for the column names. Notice that the series used to create the data frame must have the same index. Here, the series share the identifiers Tokyo and Amsterdam. Toronto exists in the city's revenue, but not city employee count. And that is why the value for Toronto in the employee count column is NAN. Look at the axes of the data frame. This is a list of two index objects. The first is the rows, and the second is the columns. Keep this in mind as you go through the course. The axis of 0 is the row axis, and the axis of 1 is the column axis. Try this exercise to test your knowledge of data frame internals. The NBA data frame has a column with a number of points scored in a game by a team. Was the column spelled P-O-I-N-T-S, or was it shortened to P-T-S? You can check using the N keyword. Recall that a data frame has two axes, the first being rows, and second being columns. You will want to use the columns axis. This shows that PTS is the correct column, and also you could have used the keys method to get the columns. Now that you understand how series and data frames work together, in the next lesson you'll see how to drill down into the data that they hold for you.